Wisdom. It's an incredibly valuable asset. Some would say more precious than gold. It's attractive, appealing, admirable. Conversely, a lack of wisdom is the basis of immaturity, blind spots, and bad decisions. Wisdom. It can be gained over time, but it can't be rushed. But wisdom can be shared. That's precisely what we are here to do right now. Today, we are here to hack wisdom, to distill it, to understand it, and to process it. Why? To get better at life. Welcome to The Main Thing. This is your new nine-minute podcast. I'm your host, Skip Lineberg, and I've set out to interview the wisest people I know. We'll see what we can learn from each one when they're faced with an incredibly difficult, soul-piercing question. Welcome back to The Main Thing Podcast. I'm your host, Skip Lineberg. This is your nine-minute jolt of wisdom. My special guest is the most human human I've ever met. Jeffrey Seglin is a senior lecturer and director of the communications program at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. He's the author of several books on writing, ethics, and business. Jeffrey has written the syndicated column about ethics titled The Right Thing since 1998. He's the former executive editor of Inc. Magazine. Jeffrey is a graduate of Bethany College in West Virginia and Harvard Divinity School. He comes to us today from Boston. Now get ready. Over the next nine minutes, you'll discover why Jeffrey Seglin is one of the wisest people I know. Jeffrey Seglin, welcome to the Main Thing Podcast. Thank you so much for making time to join us today to share a little wisdom. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So, Jeff, I know that you write a column called The Right Thing. So this is the main thing, and we are linking up with the right thing, and only good can come from that, I would imagine. Well, let's hope. Let's hope. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I wanted to ask you that we're both content creators. You've been at it for a long time, and uh, you've been tremendously successful. But my question is, how much joy do you get from publishing your column, The Right Thing? Well, first of all, just to correct you a little bit, tremendously successful may be an exaggeration, but, but <laughs> that, that's nice of you to say. And I think by writing for a column for a long time is your kind way of telling me um, your your listeners that I'm old. Um, I I enjoy it. I get I get a lot of joy out of writing it. I have a lot because of the way I write the column. I have a lot of uh, reader feedback from different places around the country. Yeah. And it's great because they're all over the place and they're of all political varieties. They're, I assume they're of all heights and weights, um, but right. <laughs> and um, sometimes they're writing to agree. Sometimes they're writing to disagree, but I respond to most everything I, I get. And it's always very interesting to engage yeah, with well, the readers. Perfect segue. Cause the next thing I want to ask you is give us one or two of your all time favorite ethical dilemmas or questions that readers have presented for you to comment on. What are, what are some of your favorites of all time? Um, you know, the, I can tell you what my favorites were. I can tell you the ones that the readers respond to uh, most. The, the, there was one, one of my favorite ones that readers actually did respond to was a rec- recent one where I was talking about the whole um, COVID vaccine and the registration being different from state to state and just about stories we're hearing about people trying to jump in line. Um, and I, I was taken with this idea of this um, Southern African um, concept of Ubuntu. Yeah. Which, uh, which is the idea of community. And it, it kind of translates as um, I am because we are and that that kind of sharing and I exist because of everybody else. So I, I chose to embrace that and just breathe and be patient about waiting for my turn. And that yeah. got a lot of response from people in the very, and mostly in a very positive way, which was um, which was terrific. I can also tell you that whenever I write about whether or not it's OK to take things out of somebody's recycling bin. Okay. That will get the most, I can write about murder. I can write about terrible things. If I write about somebody taking your recycling, people just get all really worked up about that. Oh, you're, I love you're, it. You're stealing yeah. money from the city. You're doing it. It's right. It's, it right. Really oh my gosh. It, it, basically the column looks at how people make ethical choices. So there's a wide variety yeah. of things to write about. So it's been, it's been fun to do. Fertile ground and, and fascinating space for sure. Jeffrey, before we get much further along, let's help our audience out here like we do each episode to understand how you and I are connected. We're new friends, and um, I'll start the story, and if you would, please jump in and uh, and continue it. But I had the pleasure of being introduced to you by our, our mutual friend, Emmy Yankasek Gamble, 
who uh, listeners will recognize from a recent ep- she's been a recent guest here on the Main Thing podcast. How did you meet Emmy, and how long have you known each other? I think Emmy and I must know each other for about ten years. Um, okay. Emmy was uh, we knew th- each other through uh, I'm an, uh, I graduated from Bethany College. And um, Emmy was the chair of the communications program there. And Bethany is um, is fairly remote from where I am in Boston, so it's always great to go back there. And I've been back since to do some things for her, and she's always been um, just a terrific person in terms of uh, bouncing ideas off of. Oh, what a great thinker. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, Jeffrey, that brings us to the pivotal moment in our show where I want to ask you that fundamental question that I ask each of my wise guests Jeffrey Seglin, what's the main thing you've learned in your lifetime so far? Uh, Skip, the main thing I've learned in my lifetime so far is to be insatiably curious. Ah, insatiably curious. Yes, to just not accept anything at face value, to just dig deep and to explore uh, information, options, people, opportunities, to just... Be insatiably curious. Jeffrey, if someone's listening and their takeaway is, you know, I need to become more curious, what are some practices or tips that you would share with them that that might help them level up in in this area? Um, I think, well, I think reading, um, reading, well, this is self-serving because my column is syndicated in the newspaper, (laughs) reading reading newspapers or reading newspapers online, uh, setting aside time. You know, I yeah. think some of it's discipline. I think you probably know this as well as I. The only way you get your work done, particularly if you have a side hustle of writing, because my full-time job is teaching and directing sure. education's program, is setting aside um, an hour every morning where I'm writing, even if it's very early in the morning, and even if what I write turns out to be crap and I have to throw it out. Um, setting aside the time to read where it becomes kind of a discipline where you're always doing yes. it. And then the other stuff you find served surreptitiously. And then I encourage people to not just follow people on Twitter or um, let's use Twitter as an example, not just sure. follow people on social media who you agree with. Um, yes. You know, I think following if you're um, liberal, following more conservative outlets or more conservative politicians or more mm-hmm. conservative voices. If you're conservative doing the same thing, be just be, and don't just, if you live in Boston, don't just follow everybody in Boston, you know, spread right. it out that way because then it becomes really, it becomes much, a much more interesting world. If you realize there are points of commonality, even among those who are very polarized. Definitely. That's great advice. Jeffrey, a couple other questions for you. I wanted to ask, where did you develop your deep sense of ethical behavior of, of doing the right thing? Where do you think that comes from in you uh, as a person? Um, well, first of all, I just want to make sure you know that just because I write about ethics is no guarantee that I have any. Um, okay. but, <laughs> Fair but, enough. But, but, but it's, it's, it's nice of you to assume, but I like to think I do. I Folks, like there's think, our uh, our disclaimer. <laughs> I like to think that I do. I think I think all most of us get it from the same type of way, way where we get them from our parents, sure. our teachers. Um, if we if we're if we belong to a faith, we get it from our faith leaders. Um, so we, we 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 sort of grab those values early on, and those don't really change <clears throat> over time. The priority for them might change. Um, sure. you know, the value we place on our family might might take precedence over the value we take in telling our boss off when he does something wrong. <laughs> family fed. Um, but I, I the way it developed for the column is that when I was an editor at a business man, at a business magazine. Um, we used to run, it was, um, um, Inc magazine, which was about startup companies, uh, growth companies. Yeah. Great um, publication. We Still used to, uh, we used to run, uh, pieces about people who would do what some would consider clever things to appear bigger than they are, or to seem like something they weren't to get customers or loans. And it yeah. could be something as simple as answering the phone five different ways to pretend you had a lot of different departments. And whenever we ran stories <laughs> like that, we would get letters in from people, saying, how could you feature a person like that when ah. they're, they're deceiving people? And then we ah, run okay. letters. Then we get a whole other set of letters that would say, well, they're just naive. Of course you have to do that. It, you, have to, you have to be able to do that. It's not, you're just presenting yourself in the best possible. So we do this kind of thing. So I started writing um, an ethics column for um, Inc. where I looked at um, how people made ethical choices in business for Inc., 
And then I went off to work on a book for a year. Yeah. And that was when um, Jim Schachter at the New York Times was redesigning the Sunday money and business section and called me actually as a reference for a, a guy he was trying to hire who I knew and then yeah. said, what do you do? And I told him I was leaving to do this. And he said, well, we don't have one of those in the thing I'm redesigning. So he's the one who came up with that for the, it ran every, the third Sunday of every month. And this is, I think the first one ran in like September of 1998. So that yeah. was where that crystallized in terms of thinking about business ethics and how people made those choices. When I was in graduate school and st- at divinity school, I mostly studied um, theology and literature. Sure. And maybe had two ethics courses, but it didn't stem from that. It stemmed from looking at how people make decisions um, and how they make ethical choices. Because often, when we're faced with ethical choices, there's never, there's rarely a, 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 a dramatically right answer or wrong answer. We're often mm-hmm. trying to choose between or among multiple right answers. We're trying to make an ethical choice about what's the best right answer we can choose. That middle ground, that gray area. Yeah, we can agree that murder is wrong, but other than that, right. um, there are most mostly we're trying to do that that sort of area where what's the best right thing we can do. So classical definition of a dilemma, right? Yeah. Well, the dilemma is you have yeah you have well the dilemma is typically of two choices that aren't good, <laughs> but this is the, so it's always <laughs> okay. like you're trying to choose two that are bad. But yeah, it's like having multiple choices. I think people, that's why I think going with your gut or your instinct isn't always the best isn't always the best way to do it because your gut and instinct will give you one right answer. Will it give you the best right answer? I'm not always sure. And we're not always in the position where we yeah. have of having the time to think that through. But I think if you really want to eth- make an ethical choice, there's a thought process that's involved about what are the implications of my actions? Is this going to affect somebody detrimentally who has no reason to be affected detrimentally? Is there a way to do this that saves somebody who would be... Yes. Hurt? So... And that had to have that be fueled by perhaps insatiable curiosity. Yes, I'm just it, may, it means that it, there's, I'm never at a loss for ideas. Jeffrey, I would love to continue for another hour and explore uh, some of my areas of curiosity that you are involved in. But uh, for the sake of the show and our format, nine minutes of wisdom, uh, we'll wrap it up here. But I thank you so much for coming on and joining the wisdom conversation and for sharing your lesson to be insatiably curious. Uh, You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Wow, nine minutes is up. That goes by incredibly fast, doesn't it? Time flies when you're hacking wisdom. I hope you're left wanting more. Sync up with us again next time on The Main Thing for nine more minutes of wisdom. Hi, it's Skip here. You've heard about our merchandise store for the Main Thing Podcast. And I want to tell you about our bookshop. It's an online independent bookstore where you can find and order the books that were written, recommended, and discussed by guests of the Main Thing Podcast. Just check the show notes for a link that'll take you to bookshop.org slash shop slash the main thing. Buy some books, support independent local booksellers, and support the guests of the Main Thing Podcast.